Great. Um, I'll, I'll begin. Uh, for those of you who joined us on time, thank you for sharing some technical drama with us. Uh, uh, you know, we, we had captions, but they were Zoom captions. And in my experience, our experience, generally, we, we retain a captioner um, specifically because, in case Lisa, because um, CART captions, live captions, are generally more accurate. So thank you for your patience while we try to get an optimal captioning service provided. Um, having said that, Russ, are you going to contact uh, Gail Lynn then? Yes, I'm trying. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, let me um, let me welcome everyone, and again, thank you for your your patience. Um, hope everyone enjoyed a good Thanksgiving. Hope everyone is not having all the technical difficulties that occur from time to time. It seems with things. Um, I'm Judy Alden. I'm president of the HLA ADC chapter. And for those of you who don't know me, and on behalf of our board, uh, joining us today from the board are, are uh, Rachel and Russ. Uh, welcome, welcome to this, this program. Today's program is with Dr. Gail Lynn. Some of you may know her. Her practice, Potomac Audiology, is in Rockville, Maryland. And, it's a, and, and the topic is Ask the Audiologist. So it's a wonderful opportunity to, to ask her questions of a very knowledgeable, experienced audiologist. Before we proceed to today's programs, this seems almost redundant, but let's go over how to use Zoom. <laughs> Rachel, thank you again for getting us getting us fixed up here technically. I, you know things that uh, I think must be generational. I simply cannot add value to, so thank you. But we're ready to roll. Please do mute yourself, which at the bottom of, of, the, of the screen, there, there are this row of icons. Most of you know this, but there's always someone who's new and doesn't. Please put the, 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 the diagonal over that to mute yourself so we don't hear your wonderful dog and fire trucks in the neighborhood and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Is a video, personally, I very much appreciate people leaving their video on so we can see one another. Not only does it help read lips, it helps the presenter have a sense of, of reaction and feedback, um, but also I think importantly, it creates community, even though we're virtually get to know one another, which is very important. Okay. Um, the chat box also at the bottom of your screen is an option where you can enter burning questions in the moment. Okay. Uh, and I'll leave it to Dr. Lynn to determine how she'd like to ask, have questions asked, whether it's raise your hand or chat box or, or whatever, whatever process. But so, so you remember your question, be sure to get an answer before the end of the session you're invited to use chat box. And screen placement, if you put your cursor over the screen, I do this particularly with the captioning, you can move around and place the boxes where it's most convenient for you. The chat box can be moved on your screen as can captions. So you're not, you're not covering anything important. Okay. Um, a quick topic worth repeating. HLA, a membership in you. We are a as you know, we are a, a volunteer organization. Your membership makes these programs and many other activities possible. Your time and talents are much appreciated and, and welcome. Um, if you're an HLA member already, thank you very much. If not, uh, I, will, I will post in chat the link to HLA National, hearingloss.org slash membership, where you can get information and sign up online to become a member. And, and uh, there, are, there are many benefits for that. Just a few more things on my quick sheet here. Uh, among HLA ADC chapters, many activities is advocacy. Many of you, and thank you, have been with us the last three years as we've successfully advocated to establish the DC Office of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. That past council, the mayor reluctantly agreed Congress approved it. Now I'm happy to say the office is housed at the Reeves building uh, uh, around 14th Street and is staffed. Uh, last month, Russ and I had the opportunity to attend a meeting at the request of, of Carrie Cook, the director, to um, meet the inaugural staff and voice our concerns and expectations. Um, enough said about that for the moment, but stay tuned. There's a lot more to come in that regard. 
And again, thank everyone for their help to make this a reality. Um, at this point, let me introduce Rachel for, more formally. Larry, question? Um, I just want to make sure I'm not getting chat anymore. So I know you said you're going to post and people are going to put questions. I don't know if I'm the only one. So I was just wondering if others have the ability to get into chat. So you can get in a chat. Like oh, when I click on I, it, I, I have chat. Anyone else not have chat? It's me. I have Larry, it's, it's, it's fine yeah. to raise your hand if that under participants, I think it is. You can you can raise your hand, whatever works best. I'll let Dr. Lynn speak to her preference. But I find sometimes, you know, in the middle of a topic, rather than interrupt the speaker, if you go to chat, post your question, we always go back and review those before the session ends. Okay, thank you. Um, to Rachel, Rachel, please, if you could speak about some upcoming activities. Sure. Uh, so the first <coughs> thing, um, so first of all, Larry, I don't know if it's helpful, but if you expand the, the Zoom screen, you might just need to make it bigger so you can see the icons at the bottom. Oh, I see it. I you see can it, see it. Okay. Yeah. And I had chat uh, before, mm -hmm. I, I uh, like I sent to Russell, but then it disappeared after you made the change. So, hey, I'll just okay. pick up my hand if I need to. Okay, that sounds good. It Thank might you. it might pop up under the more button or it might pop up if I put something in the chat in a minute, you might see it again. Uh, so we'll we'll see if that works. Um, so the first thing I wanted to mention is um, we use Amazon Smile. And what that means is you can go into your Amazon account and select an organization so that every time you make a purchase, a little bit of that purchase goes towards um, our chapter. So I, I'm putting in our, our Amazon Smile link and um, it's a very, very small percent that comes to us, which is why we hope that more people will um, donate. That would be great. Um, so I wanted to mention that. And then our next event this month is on December 18th. Um, the DC chapter is, is going to the Kennedy Center for an open caption showing of a soldier's play. It's at 2 p.m. I'm also going to put a link in the chat for where you can buy the tickets and be sure to pick um, the open caption showing at 2 p.m. and then also be sure to pick um, the, uh, the accessible seating. Uh, so we will be there and we hope that you will join us and there's the link. Uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Rachel. Um, and, and uh, Lisa and uh, Ewan and, and uh, Ken Klusky are unable to be at this meeting, also board members. And they had the idea to put together this, this December event at the Kennedy Center. Um, regarding December events, I know all of us used to look forward to pre-COVID uh, to having an annual holiday party, which was always great fun. Again, this year, that's on hiatus. We are looking forward to having that live as soon as possible. Um, I personally seem to have a little bit of a cold negative for COVID, but, you know, in, in the spirit of being super cautious, um, we're going to keep, keep closely observant about the status of those things. Similarly, with these monthly meetings, I know we all miss having those live in person. It's, it's, it's a great way to see one another and share. However, um, currently at DC Public Libraries, where we hold those, they recommend masks and as we know, masks and hearing loss are kind of incompatible, plus the, the, the COVID threats. So having said that, we'll continue to do this for now uh, via Zoom. Um, at this point, I think that's all the announcements. Anyone else have an announcement to make? If not, Russ, let me turn it over to you to introduce uh, Dr. Gail in today's, uh, today's presenter. So, <laughs> Well, if we're not careful, we might get this. Um, thank you so much for, did you want to say something first, Russ? No, go ahead. Okay. Well, I think I know many of the people here, every face that I see, I recognize. Potomac Ideology um, is where I work. Uh, I have a career that spans 38 years. I started back in 1984 when in a different uh, life, I was married to an ear, nose and throat doctor and he had an audiologist. 
and she left and we had trouble finding someone. And I don't know if anybody knows Joe Smaldino. Uh, he was, uh, you do, you do, Larry. Joe was the head of the program at the University of Northern Iowa. We called him and he came over and visited us. And, he, and so he taught me how to give a quick hearing test. And he said, you know, I've been looking for a place to bring students. So um, he started bringing, bringing students and I learned how to give a hearing test and I fell in love with audiology almost immediately. Unfortunately, I had some small children so he suggested that I get my hearing aid dealer's license. And uh, I did that. And then, so that was about 1985, I got a hearing aid dealer's license. And then in 1991, I went for a master's in audiology when my kids got old enough. Um, so I was around Joe Smaldino three times a week. He brought students in. So before I went to school, I had had a lot of experience. So in many ways, I was uh, very lucky to have those experiences. Um, I opened up Iowa hearing clinics in Waterloo, Iowa, and we had four offices that went about around about a quarter of the state. I had a number of employees, and then I fell in love and sold my practice and moved to Rockville which was my home. I grew up in this area and I opened up Potomac Audiology. I didn't know a soul. So here I was opening up the doors and had no idea how to get started. So I took a job with the American Speech Language Hearing Association and they allowed me to see patients in the evening and on the weekends. So I did that for about four years from 2001 to 2000, almost five. And then when I was uh, large enough, I left ASHA. While I was there, I had the wonderful opportunity uh, to work on the compatibility with cell phones and hearing aids. I wrote some practice documents, or I should say that I was the ex officio on uh, cochlear implants, um, hearing conservation, and several other documents. So I had a really nice uh, experience there and learned a lot. Then uh, I think it was about 2005, I was full-time then at Potomac Audiology. During uh, several years before that, my daughter said, I'd like to be an audiologist. I almost fell over. I said, wonderful. So she went to school, went to the University of Maryland, and she's with me now. So I've had some wonderful experiences in the profession. And not only is audiology uh, my job, but it's also my passion. Nothing makes me happier than when I'm able to say at the end of the day, I made someone's life better. So let's go on to the next uh, slide, Russ. So I had some things. I started Iowa Hearing Clinics. I worked at the American Speech Language Hearing Association. Oh, I, I bet was treasurer for the Maryland Academy up until uh, last year. Uh, for almost 18 years, I was uh, treasurer there. Uh, I've also done eight years of research with NIH on a project that was funded by the Aging Institute. And I spoke at the Institute of Medicine 2015 when they had their two-year um, group that met on how hearing uh, and hearing loss is addressed in our country. So those are some of my experiences. Let's move on to the next slide. And by the way, I, sh I don't know if you would like me to stop periodically and open up. Does anybody have any questions with what I said so far? Nope. Oh, okay. So to me, the ear is an engineering miracle. When you think of the thousands of little hair cells uh, in the cochlea, our balance center is there. Uh, it's, it's so finely tuned and is finely tuned all the way up to the brain. Let's go on to our next slide. So I'm talking to very educated people here. So uh, I probably didn't need to do all of this. So let's go on to the next one. So we know that the sound starts at the cochlea, but I always explain to people, we don't hear with our ear, we hear with our brain. And so as an audiologist, what I have to do is try to help my patients uh, find a way to get enough information 
to the brain so the brain knows wh what words to fire. Okay. Let's go to the, yeah. Did, so I, did I hear a noise? No, okay. Let's go on to the next slide. And there we see our outer hair cells on the right and our inner hair cells on the left. We'll go on to the next slide. And on our left side, we see a nice healthy cochlea, probably like most of us looked when we were 15, 20 years old. And on the right, this is what happens to us as we start aging and have age-related hearing loss. This is a PowerPoint that I kind of um, worked with that I typically take for talks. So again, I probably didn't need to do this with my audience today. Let's go on to the next one. And so uh, what we see here is uh, what we call an audiometric curve. The conversation area shows uh, what frequencies that we need to have accessible to us for a person to be able to, to hear and understand speech. Our audition goes all the way down to 20 hertz and all the way up to 20,000 hertz. And we hear different sounds, but we see that conversation area is what we need to have in order to communicate properly. Let's go on to the next slide. Have our speech banana. Again, all, this is all repetition to you. Uh, let's go to our next slide. And so that takes us um, onto what I would call uh, the part where we talk about correcting a hearing loss. After all, that's what most people uh, come to our office to see us. And so we'll move on to the next slide. And the key, I believe that the key to better hearing is measuring. So typically this is what I talk about. I have a patient here that allowed me to show the, the uh, measurement equipment that we use. We use a Fry 8000, we have about seven of them in our office. And you see the microphones um, on the back of the ear and then the tube at, that's under the ear going into the canal the speaker, which is going to deliver a composite signal and help us measure. And we'll go to the next slide. And I don't know, I probably, I, this is a video from our office and I was going to play this. I don't think, do you have an arrow there, Russ, on your, uh, I mean, I mean, do you have, see an arrow in the middle of the picture to play the video? Mm -mm. Probably not. See, when I had it here, it was hooked up to my uh, Wi-Fi to run that. So that's okay. We don't we don't have to do that. Well, on our on our website, we actually do have a little video that shows the programming, and that's my daughter and her mother-in-law sitting there. Let's go to the next video. I mean, to the next screen. That's okay. We if, if you can't if you can't play that, that's all right. No, I can't. Yeah, we'll go to the next screen. It's not a big deal. I don't seem to be able to do that either. Oh, there we go. All righty. So when we do a first fit, typically this is what we see. Um, the top dotted line represents what we want coming out of a hearing aid. That's developed by putting in the audiogram of the patient. So that shows what we use um, NAL1. I think it says on there. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's what we usually end up with, something even oftentimes uh, worse than that. So if I weren't measuring, I would have no idea what that patient is listening to. Let's go to the next screen. Here's another first fit. You can see the first fits of the manufacturers aren't that good. Um, so again, that's why I believe that measuring is extremely important. Let's go on to the next screen. And here we are. Uh, I think that's that first screen after I did my real ear measures and matched the prescriptive target. So what this makes sure is that 
in your base, mid, and high frequencies, we're giving the amplification needed in order for the each letter in a word to be hopefully about the same loudness. So let's go on to the next screen. There's a, just another picture of uh, doing the real ear measures. So let's see, I guess we need to go back one. Oops. Well, those are, I was showing how I took the, the real ear measures and matched the prescriptive target. Do we have any questions about what I've talked about so far? Okay. And Russ, are you have, I kind of wanted to go, well, we can go forward. What we, we see is that that middle line is our uh, 65 dB input and our uh, 50 D input is in the a different blue at the bottom. So now we can actually measure soft speech. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see that we can. So there, there is our uh, loud sounds uh, and that's not matching very well. And I think on the next screen, I show it matching a little better. So there's a full fitting where we've taken somebody's hearing aid and we've matched the soft, mid, and loud sounds. And usually when I do that, people are very, very happy with their hearing aid fitting. So this is my passion. And typically when I go out and talk with people, this is what I talk about. Um, some of the th reasons that I think measuring is extremely important. If I didn't measure, number one, I would have no clue uh, what a first fit would look like. If I change a dome, if I put an ear mold on, all of that has consequences. Uh, and so when I do that, and then I measure again, I see the consequences of what I'm doing. That also helps me know which manufacturers I like the best. So I may have a, a manufacturer that I don't like very well, uh, and they'll come up with something new and somebody will prompt me to try them again. And when I measure them, I find that I'm able to mass match that prescriptive target. Excuse me. I actually do all seven major manufacturers, which is quite unusual. Uh, but the reason that we do that is about 30% of the people that come to our office bring hearing aids that, that they already had what I like to do is reprogram their hearing aids. I like to do that for two reasons. Number one, I think the patient needs to know it's not the hearing aid that makes the biggest difference. It's the, the person fitting the hearing aid. So I've taught that person a really, really important uh, concept there because I've had people come in and say, well, what's your favorite hearing aid? Well, I do have my favorite hearing aids, but I can almost take any hearing aid and I can get it to work quite well. I was working yesterday. I had a lady that came in with an old Audeo from 2011, and I reprogrammed it to match her prescriptive, tar prescriptive target almost perfectly. And she was just shocked at how well she could hear. So I told her, go home, give this a try. If you're happy with it, we're done. If you go home and say, you know, this is a lot better, but I'm not hearing as well as I would like to. I said, then come back and we can try something new on the market, but at least you have a good backup if nothing else. So as an audiologist, and I, I, I see Larry shaking his head in agreement, is that we have to educate the public that it's not the hearing aid that makes the difference, it's who's fitting it and whether they're using um, all of the tools in their toolbox that they should have. And in this case, real ear measures. On to the next one. And just um, benefits of uh, performing real ear. Let's go on to the next one. So there's a before and after. Lately, I have actually been taking people's 
uh, cell phones. And I will take a photocopy of what that was before they came in with their cell phone, the real ear, and then when we're done. That way they can um, show it to their family and friends, the improvement that we made. So in fact, the lady yesterday, that's exactly what we did so that she could go home and, and look at it and remember. Are you liking that, Larry? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's go on to the next picture. So uh, as I was saying before, measuring uh, gives me insight into the different hearing aid companies. Um, we do, I, I don't know why I have Sonic Innovation, that's from a long time ago, but um, we do all the major manufacturers right now. Phonak happens to be my favorite hearing aid, followed by Oticon, followed by Resound, followed by Signia. Uh, I like Starkey for the little itty bitty ones. They make the best shells in my opinion. Um, Widex I wasn't very happy with for a long time, but their new moment is um, doing a very good job. So I'm gonna open this up for some questions right now. Can we stop screen sharing? Sure. Okay. Gail, you mentioned uh, a moment ago that you didn't think it was so important what brand of hearing aid a person has. Um, but I have been curious, and I was interested to hear your one, two, three choices there. Is there a place to go, like Consumer Reports, that rates hearing aids? Do, and all of a sudden I'm forgetting the name of the gentleman that's, that's um, uh, it starts with a C, it's not Clay. Um, can anybody think of the guy that uh, does all the videos? Can you think of him, Larry? Yeah. Dr. Cliff. Oh, Dr. Cliff, that's it, yeah. So I, I, every once in a while, I'll listen to Dr. Cliff. And um, he does a very good job of that. Also, um, the consumer's reports, I do. Um, in fact, when I worked at ASHA, I helped them with their consumer report uh, back in 2000, probably two or three. So you can, you can find it there. But actually, Dr. Cliff does a great job. So that's where I would send you, Ben. Other questions? Uh, thank you, Gail. Is there, maybe I missed it. Did you say how we can find Dr. Cliff? Do we just Google? Yeah, yeah. If you just put Dr. Cliff, uh, I, he's gotten so popular that you will find all kinds of videos from him. And he does some, some really great uh, educational videos that I think are wonderful for patients to watch. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So unusual, so, yeah. it's, it's, you know, Gail, I believe it's unusual for audiologists to basically handle all of the major manufacturers. Is that the case? Yes, I would say most people do one or two and maybe three at the most. But the reason that we do all seven major manufacturers is, is because when somebody walks in the door, I wanna be able to uh, fix their hearing aids. That means I have the software, I have all the cables, I have a lot of the knowledge, um, even if it's not my favorite hearing aid. But I can make, with, with measuring, I can get most hearing aids to work pretty well. Sometimes I might, if, let's say somebody comes in with a relatively new hearing aid. Um, for a while, I had that with the White X. And I, if I ordered a custom ear mold and some different things like that, I was able to get the hearing aids to match the prescriptive target. If the hearing aid is very, very old, you know, then I don't know whether the person wants to invest in ear molds. But at least they, they are able to watch me measure. They understand uh, uh, something about what we do that might be a little bit different. I don't know how many people are measuring these days. I'm thinking it's in the 20%. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Larry? I think it's somewhere between 30 to 40% that oh. use real ear. I know I get an article looking at this and I was shocked when I did a survey but most do not like yours uh, mentioning. Right, right. 
So, I mean, I think the profession of audiology um, has fallen down and I'm always on the bandwagon to try to get more and more people to measure. And I, and actually, um, as I had mentioned before, being invited to speak to the Institute of Medicine, um, I wasn't against when they decided to do over-the-counter hearing aids. I sort of felt that maybe some competition might be a good thing, uh, where maybe people Hi, felt I'm like Cliff they- I'm doctor of audiology and founder of Applied Hearing Solutions in Phoenix, Arizona, and welcome- Whoops. Dr. Oops. Smith AUD. I'm going to cut right to the chase. I want you to subscribe to my channel, but you're probably thinking, why should I? Well, the world of hearing loss and hearing treatment. Okay. We, we just heard Dr. Cliff there. I think our, our Ben must have been looking for him <laughs> and he found him. So let's see, where, where was I? Where was I? Oh, yeah, ahead, talking sure. to the Institute of Medicine. Interestingly enough, a bunch of people called me and wanted me to lobby against over-the-counter hearing aids, and, and I didn't do it. As a matter of fact, I would say in the last three or four months, I've had two or three people come in with low normal hearing that really were bothered by their hearing loss. And I, I, um, I think I sent them to lively hearing aids before I had sent people to Bose uh, to those hearing aids if they wanted just to get something uh, that was less expensive. So I do think there's a place for over-the-counter hearing aids. Does anybody else have any feelings about that? Yeah, I do, but I'm I'm going to hold them here for a while and let. There are several hands that are up. Um, okay. Richard Roberts, I think you may have been the first. Yes, I just wanted to ask the doctor what made her rank the favorite manufacturers in the rank order in which she did, or all the manufacturers, you ranked them. What, what criteria did you use to rank them the way you did? Yes, okay, so typically, I keep a little running list, sometimes a, a real list, sometimes just in my head. If I fit someone with a hearing aid and they come back and say, wow, I love this, it was great. Um, it was easy for me to fit. I, I was able to, um, match the prescriptive target without difficulty, uh, and the person is doing really, really well, that, that gets a, a, a check mark in the good box for me. Or if somebody comes back and they're not doing well, they're not doing well in noisy environments, we've tried multiple changes and adjustments and they're still not doing well. So I always explain to people, the manufacturers tell me they're great. They tell me that their hearing aids do all these different things. And I don't know whether that is actually going to happen until I have people going out into those listening environments and reporting back to me. So I, I always explain that the patients are the ones that help me by their critique on how they're doing to, to choose my favorite hearing aids. By the way, how did you companies. rank? How yeah. did you rank Oticon? Oticon? Second. And, you know, I, I would say that maybe Phonak and Oticon are kind of equal in my book. Do you, wear, do you wear Oticon? I do now. And I think they cost something like $6,000. I got them maybe two years ago. Uh, and I think they can do a lot better. So I may be going back to have them checked out. Yeah, yeah. Lisa Finkelstein, had a hand, you have a hand up? Um, Gail is my audiologist, and I got to her practice um, through another audiologist, Therese Walden, um, be, who had not seen the Bose earphone. So I went in with my prescription and showed how the Bose worked. And it was Therese who discovered that they were, my audiologist had not used real ear. And the so if anyone here has not had real ear done, I absolutely 500% agree with what Gail has said because I saw it demonstrated on the computer as Therese made the adjustment and I could hear the changes. And Therese said my hearing aids were underperforming by at least 30 or 35%. And I have new hearing aids that I got from Gail um, and she explained why what the difference was between my six-year-old Starkeys 
and I can hear the difference as she adjusts with the real ear. Um, so, and my audiologist was embarrassed that she hadn't used it, the old audiologist. Um, and she knew about it. She said, I'd gotten away from it. I feel bad about it, but I switched and I'm so happy I did. Paul Silverman, you have a hand up. Paul, are you there? Paul, yeah, you're muted, I think. Paul, you're muted. Yeah, sorry. I got I got that you can hear me now. Yeah. Um I use a Phonak Bolero Bicross hearing aid and recently was obliged to order a, a new one. The the one that I'm currently using is I think it's behind the ear or over the ear. I'm not really sure, but I'm told that uh, Phonak no longer makes the bolero with that kind of um, attachment. Are you familiar with the change? And do you, have you found that there's any uh, decrease in quality in the new hearing aid, which I gather is small? It doesn't use the what is it, a 313 battery? It uses a smaller battery. And I'm just wondering, I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm just wondering if I can expect the same quality in, in the new hearing aid. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I can't speak to that completely because I don't know what you're getting. Um, Phonak does not make a Bolero cross anymore. They have their Audeo series, which is, is their wired receiver in the ear. Um, and, uh, I have actually stopped doing the Phonak uh, cross aid and I've moved on to Oticon and I'll tell you why. Number one, uh, you can't use the app, the uh, My Phonak app with a cross. And I think that's really, really important. Um, I also find that the, the Phonak, the rechargeable hearing aids don't make it through a day very well. And that's unacceptable. Uh, and the the ones that use they do have it with a with a battery, uh, but that's still uh, not acceptable. So I I've done about three cross fittings in the last four months with the Oticon, and it they have been spectacular, really really good. So and and they're rechargeable. I've not had anybody have trouble with the uh, battery lasting the entire day. Um, and also they're able to use their app on their phone uh, with their cross aid. So that made me happy. There's another thing that I kind of like about the Oticon in their rechargeables, I can change the battery. So if we have trouble with the battery, I don't have to send the hearing aid in uh, to the factory to be changed. So there's, the, so there's, there's pros and cons. I always explain to people, there's no perfect hearing aid. But when a patient comes in, I look at their degree of hearing loss. I look at their de dexterity. I look at what their needs are. So for instance, one of the things that I like about Oticon over Phonak uh, is if I have a patient that maybe doesn't have a cell phone, they don't have really good feeling in the tips of their fingers. I can make the Oticon change the volume on one ear and the programs on the other ear. That way, when the patient's pushing on the back, of the hearing aid is not as important uh, how they hit it on the back. And sometimes when people don't have um, a cell phone, I'll get them a remote control. But some of the different features, some of the different accessories uh, for the different hearing aids might prompt me to um, order one hearing aid over another. Uh, I just ordered a couple of Widex uh, last week for a patient who's worn Widex for 10, 15 years successfully. And so uh, that's one hearing aid that I find that the processing is so very different that anytime I've tried to switch people to a different manufacturer, they're not very happy. So, you know, those are all sort of reasons that I do all of them, not only just because I can uh, program uh, the hearing aids that walk in the door that need reprogramming and the person may not need new hearing aids. Um, I don't do a lot of Starkey, but when I have somebody that wants a hearing aid that you cannot see, uh, that is probably, they make the best shell. 
and they make the best smallest hearing aid, therefore I'm able to get a larger vent and that venting is very important. If I go with a IIC, which stands for those little hearing aids that go all the way down into the canal. With Phonak, they do a pretty good job, but they, they can't make it so that I can get the vent as loud as I want, as large as I want to. So, you know, there's different reasons that I'll pick one manufacturer over another. So I hope that answers the question for you. Thank you. I, one other question, if I may. Do sure. both Phonak and the Oticon have telecoil cable uh, connections? The phone act does not, I, I believe, but, but the Oticon does. All right, thank you. Aaron Bopp, you have a, uh, an entry in the chat box, which um, you can read or I can read, or you can just talk about. Karen? Okay, I'm unmuted now. I've okay. just put that question in the chat box. I'm, I wear in my right ear a Phonax hearing aid that I received from Gallaudet University. And I have a cochlear implant made by Med-L in my left ear. I've had it now two years since it was implanted by my surgeon, Dr. Michael Ho at Georgetown University Hospital, MedStar. And um, I'm still hearing so many squeaky noises almost all the time. Occasionally I can hear a word, but there's a lot of distraction with the squeaky noises. And what I'm also finding with my hearing aid, it can be very loud. And so um, I, it's just, I went uh, to a party uh, luncheon yesterday with about 30 people. We were all sitting and talking and it was just a lot of noise in both of my ears. And I had a hard time following the conversation. I was sitting right next to my good friend and she was speaking and looking at me directly and I was reading her lips and that helped me a little bit. But I'm just so frustrated by the noise in my cochlear implant, and I'm thinking on my hearing aid, really maybe what I should do is try to turn the volume down so it it's not making so much noise in my ear. But I've never, um, Dr. Lynn, I didn't know about measuring hearing aids. So I haven't uh, done that with my hearing aids. Before I had my cochlear implant uh, put in my ear two years ago, I had been wearing Phonax hearing aids for many years. Yeah, so you, you know, not everybody has the same experience with a cochlear implant. And that's one of the difficult things because we don't really know how each person is going to do. Luckily, most of the people that I have recommended to get cochlear implants, they've done great. But I have had a few people who have not. So, um, and again, that is no disrespect to the doctors. I mean, there's, because we can't get into the ear and know everything that's going on, uh, it's difficult to completely predict. But, you know, another thing that I explain to people is that you can think of your hearing a little bit like your vision. If something isn't, if, if there's not enough light, you can't see something, right? But if there's too much light, you can't see either. And I believe the same thing um, happens with our hearing. If something's too soft, we can't hear it. But when something's too loud, it distorts it. It makes it just a different type of difficulty in hearing. So um, I typically, you know, when I, when I program a hearing aid for people, I always explain to them that that target is a starting place. But you know, all of life is a bell curve. We probably have a, a percentage of people that want their hearing aids right on target. I have some people that are thrilled with 75% or 80% or 85%. Uh, I have a few people that like it above the prescriptive target. So um, actually, interestingly enough, when I spoke to the Institute of Medicine, they wanted me to talk on private practice audiology. And what I did is I looked at my previous year of patients 
all new patients, by the way. And I looked at how much time I spent with those patients. I spent anywhere from 12 to 20 hours. So there's an adaptation, uh, particularly for first time users that occurs. Uh, hearing loss starts uh, or, or uh, uh, comes along very gradually. Since the brain only needs about 50% of the information of speech, for many years, people really don't even know that they have a, a hearing loss occurring until suddenly they reach that uh, point where they understand that they're not hearing everything. But by the time I fit somebody with hearing aids or anybody gets a hearing aid, that hearing loss has been going on for a very long time. So um, I bring people in, we, we match the target, then I turn them down to where they say, this sounds really good to me. And, I'll, and their voice how, how, needs to sound good to them. My voice needs to sound good and natural. And then I send them out and I bring them back every week or two weeks. And we meet a lot during that first year as we're determining whether we need to turn it up. I ask the patients, are you raising the volume any yet? And if they say no, I don't even consider increasing the volume. Maybe if they say, um, I, I'd like a little more clarity, I might go in there and just add a little high frequencies, but we work together on getting that volume set the way it's gonna work best for you. So, you know, if you could find somebody that could work with you on that, but if you can say that, you know, this is how I'm doing in noisy environments, and I think your assessment was absolutely right, it's probably too loud. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just been so frustrating for me. I am working with an audiologist and I'm always explaining what my problem is. And I just keep trying. I'm doing a lot. I worked with Gallaudet over the summer for eight weeks and they had me work on Angel Sound app and Posit Science app. And there are different exercises. I've been doing those. I do read audio books with the printed copy that I'm reading, but I'm listening to the audio book in my ear. So I'm trying to do, and like this during the day in the morning, I listen to the news and I look at the speakers who are talking. I have the captions on my television, but I'm trying to hear, I don't look at the captions. I'm trying to hear the words in my cochlear ear. I can hear the words clearly in my hearing aid ear, but it kind of interferes then with the words that I'm trying to hear in my cochlear ear. And that's what I'm just want to, you know, I've been talking about these squeaky noises for a long time, for two years, and yet I haven't really been able to do much to help me get better. So many of my friends who have cochlear implants don't hear these squeaky noises. So I keep thinking, I just have this kind of difficult situation and I just haven't figured out how to reduce those squeaky noises and hear words that are being said me, not noises that interfere with those words. So um, have you many people who started out with that kind of a problem like I've been having and they've gotten better at actually just hearing the words using their cochlear implant? Well, um, I remember when I was working on the cochlear implant document, and this is many, many, many years ago, um, when I was working at ASHA, I actually went to an FDA meeting where they had all the manufacturers and the people uh, were invited. So I was sitting next to a lady who was maybe 45 or 50. She was born with completely normal hearing, but started getting a, a hearing loss as a teenager. And by the time she was 40, she was pretty much deaf, but she had always loved music. And when she first got her cochlear implant, she was saying music sounded horrible. Then two to three years down the road, she was sitting someplace and she said, uh, that all of a sudden she thought, oh my gosh, that's a guitar. So, you know, I thought, wow, that is so far down the road. Uh -huh. But, you know, I'm always reading books on the brain. And the brain is so magnificent that that training your brain, and there's a lot more plasticity in the brain than we really realized. 
until recent years. So it looks like who's ever been coaching you has given, given you absolutely all the right things to do. And you are being very you know, diligent in doing those things. I would try to get your ears balanced a little bit better. So when I have a patient that has a cochlear implant and a hearing aid, of course, we do the real ear measures as our starting place. And then what I try to do is uh, get them balanced. So the ears are able to detect extremely small differences in pitch and in volume. So I try to help the patient and we work together trying to make sure that if we, if you give the brain a message from each ear that's fairly balanced, it's going to do a lot, lot better. So I think maybe that, that I think it's your right ear that wears the hearing aid. Is that right? I, if, yeah. if you could, if you could get that, you can actually experiment with that a little bit yourself by turning the volume down when you watch television. Yeah, I think so. I, I was thinking about it overnight at, because I'm seeing my audiologist Wednesday this week. And I was thinking I was going to describe what was happening. And I thought, you know, I wasn't paying attention to trying to reduce the volume on my hearing aid. So it wasn't making so much noise when I was with my my part, you know, my luncheon group yesterday. And so I will try to work on that. But it just you know, I have these things I'm trying to work on and I want to make progress. I feel like I'm making a little bit of slow progress once in a while. Like today I went to church and they have got, they've just recently given me something I put into my right ear and I can hear the minister speaking clearly. And the interesting thing was I was also hearing some of her words in my left ear with my cochlear implant. So I was really excited because I was hearing the words, still a little bit of noise, but I could actually hear those words. So I just keep trying to work on these things, but so often people, first of all, speak very quickly. When I'm with a group of people, everybody's interrupting each other and I can only hear individual words once in a while, but I can't make sense of what they're saying so that I can respond and speak about the subject. I'm just not close enough to what's actually being discussed. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't wanna cut this off, but I do wanna make sure that people have some time to ask their questions. Uh, Lynn Hagens, you had one in the chat box? Yes, I do. Okay, okay. well, thank you very much. Gail for yep. talking with me about my questions. I appreciate it. You're uh -huh. welcome. Thank you. Lynn? Yes, yes. Um, Dr. Lynn, um, I have been suffering from central auditory processing disorder and I'm having issues of course with background noise, but I'm more um, having difficulty with speech processing. And I've been doing research on two different types of hearing aids that's good for speech processing the widex moment and i think it's the phonak audio paradise which one do you think is good for uh speech processing well again is is you know so what what are you looking to do is you know is to, to give yourself a little bit more information i'm assuming your hearing is normal yes it's normal they say i have okay. moderate uh hearing yeah. loss so uh, I'll just share a couple of stories with you uh, that I think are interesting. Um, many, many years ago, when I first started in the profession, I had two people that came to me that had completely normal hearing, and they were struggling. I, it was a 17-year-old boy in high school. What 17-year-old boy wants a hearing aid, right? And then I had a nurse that came in. And she said, you know, I, I'm in surgery and the doctors wear a mask and I can't understand a word that they're saying. And if, if I don't figure this out, I'm, I'm not going to be able to work in the operating room anymore. And I love that. So I said, wow, well, I don't usually fit hearing aids on people that have normal hearing. So let's, let's just try something because I have no idea what to do. So this is back in the 1980s, probably before mm -hmm. you were born. But <laughs> anyway, anyway, I've, I fit each of those people with just one hearing aid. 
that had a little bit of a high frequency emphasis. Mm -hmm. And the nurse came back and said, wow, that, that did it. I can understand with the mask. And she absolutely loved it. And, and the, and the high school student loved it as well. So, you know, for someone like yourself, just a little bit of high frequency information, uh, I think is good. Um, my preference is phone app. Uh, but again, I think the moment has, and, but I don't have as much experience with the moment uh, as I do with Phonak. So I okay. can't speak to that as well. Although my daughters who was in practice with me has told me that she likes the moment and she likes it a lot. So I think either, either one would be pretty good. As I said before, most hearing aids, when they're properly programmed, do a pretty good job. Sarah? Okay, thank you. Ah, you're welcome. Sarah has a question in the chat box as well. Sarah? Hmm. Sarah, if you're there, I think you must be muted, but I don't see. Um, Sarah, is, you know, what, what it says, it's, it's also important to note that even with the best hearing technology, restaurants are notoriously really, really difficult hearing environment. Boy, are they ever. Yeah. It's best to make plans accordingly and sit in certain locations and such. H HLAA has a great article about this. Um, yes, so Heidi Crabtree. You have an entry also, you know, in the chat box, a question asked, Heidi? Yes, um, I am totally in love with my Roger on. And for me, it's my go-to solution in restaurants or cocktail parties or anytime you're out and about because I can hear anybody I can point to. I can even hear a speaker, even if I can't see him, if I'm like in an airplane hangar or something like that because it's focusing in on exactly what I'm missing as opposed to just adding noise. So I like accessories in this case are made and break my hearing experience out and about in noisy environments. So I'll, I'll just make a little comment on that. Um, I, I love the uh, Roger on IN. Uh, it, it is so fabulous. I don't recommend it to everybody because it takes that special person who is willing to take it out and point it where they want to, to, to be able to hear well. But I typically, when somebody comes in in restaurants or they're really big problem, and I show them the Roger on IN, and we're happy to let people take it out for 30, 60 days and give it a try. Uh, everybody's experience uh, with hearing, hearing aids, accessories is a little bit different. But I always tell, I always explain to people, I am willing to work with them till we figure out the very best that, that we can get for them. So each manufacturer has different accessories, et cetera, which uh, can be helpful. So thank you, Heidi. Chat. Judy Ogden has a question in the chat box as well, and I have a similar one. Judy is asking, how would you guide folks who suspect they have a hearing loss and want to explore over-the-counter hearing aids? And my question, I guess, is similar but somewhat broader. Um, I wonder if you could speculate a little bit about how the introduction of over-the-counter hearing aids is likely to affect the audiology profession and what audiologists do and don't do. Um, my suspicion is that, you know, for some it will be a bit of a threat because they really had a monopoly, you know, on prescribing hearing aids, which they've, they're losing at least with respect for people whose hearing aid is perceived, quote unquote, um, and that's slippery to be mild or, or moderate. Um, but on the other hand, there are some opportunities to um, do things, you know, and provide services for audiologists to do things and provide services that may not have been a major part of their practice uh, in the past. 
Uh, and Judy is getting in, into a question, you know, I think about that. How do you guide people who may be looking to explore OT, OTC hearing aids? Well, I've, I find that actually fairly easy because I've done this quite a bit. About four times people have walked in the office with over-the-counter hearing aids. And guess what? I have something at my office that will allow me to know exactly what's going on with those hearing aids. I measure. So the person comes in, they get a hearing test. Uh, I'll, I'll tell the story of one gentleman. So he came in, he said, you know, I have a hearing loss and I thought maybe I would try an over-the-counter hearing aid. And I'm not sure that I'm really hearing as well as I could. So I decided to come in and get a hearing test with you and talk to you about it. So I give him the hearing test. He has a mild to moderate hearing loss. And I tell him, look, let me we do as an audiologist, at least what I do, I made the prescriptive target on my, my fry, I put the tube in his ear, I put the over-the-counter hearing aid in his ear, and we measured it. Because I said, if I run from this, you know, that's not a very good strategy for me. I better, you know, look at this uh, head on. I said, if an over-the-counter hearing aid can do a better job than I can, then I better rethink what I'm doing. Anyway, with this gentleman, uh, it, it was not very good. Um, he, and he had one that I wasn't aware of. But then I um, took a hearing aid off the counter that I had and I programmed it right after that. And I matched his target and he said, wow. I mean, that's, that's dramatically different. So, you know, for him, that worked. Uh, another person brought in a hearing aid and it, they had an app on their phone where you could give them bass and treble. So I measured it and I said, you know what? Why don't I just use that bass and treble and we'll make a program and we'll save it and you can pay me for my expertise. And he said, that's a great idea. So we, we became friends, you know? Uh, so I think that uh, if you look back a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, when people fight change, they become losers. So if you, if you find yourself like we do as audiologists, that there's some competition, then what we have to do is make sure that we don't um, try to put it down or whatever, but learn from it. Learn how to help the patient. Learn how to be better at what we do. As I said previously, I'm hoping this might make more people measure because that's really the only way when somebody comes in with an over-the-counter hearing aid to say, look, this is what this hearing aid is doing. You can see it right up on my screen. So anyway, that's, uh, did I answer your question or, or would you like, is there anything else you'd like me to address? I think you've answered. Judy, do you have anything further you want to add on that? Because in part, this is your question. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that explanation. And I agree with you. Um, <clears throat> I think OTC over-the-counter hearing aids present opportunities for a lot of people. I guess, and what I, and HLAA on its website, <clears throat> pardon me, does have some guidance about over-the-counter hearing aids. But when people inquire talking with me in conversation, I always say, how are you going to know if it's working or what you need unless you see an audiologist? And then people say, well, but the purpose of over-the-counter is not to see an audiologist. I said, well, the purpose of your hearing better is probably to get some metrics. Am I, am I misguiding people? No, I think, first of all, um, we've talked about this, and I'm, I'm happy you brought this up because I, I would have uh, let this pass by. When somebody has a hearing loss, we need to make sure they don't have a medical problem. I've had people come in with a medical problem and didn't even know it. We had somebody in our office on Thursday that felt a little plugged up on her ear. And so she came in and one of my audiologists did, uh, looked at her ear. There was no wax and did tympanometry and the eardrum looked fine. She said, you know, she's just a little plugged up. It's probably just a little stuffiness that she said is resolved. I said, you know what? Just go ahead and do a pure tone test. She had a 50% loss in that ear that felt slightly plugged up. We determined through the conversation that it was relatively recent. We called Johns Hopkins. I would talk, called Dr. Chen, who is a friend, and they got her in that day. She got on some steroids, and she uh, called the next day and said she could tell that it was getting better. And we think, and we don't know for sure, 
but it sounded like she had had a sudden hearing loss and she didn't even know it. Now, some people can tell that, but not everybody can. So, you know, we know that some people have acoustic neuromas or acoustic schwannomas. Uh, they wouldn't pick that up. They wouldn't know if they had an infection in their ear. You know, so I always explain to people, if you think that you have a hearing problem, you should at least get a good audiologic evaluation and maybe see an ENT. Again, I've had several people with low normal hearing or extremely mild hearing loss that I recommended to try an over-the-counter hearing aid. And I offered that if they wanted to bring it in, I would measure it for them so we could tell whether it was appropriate or not. So that, that might be some of the things, uh, Judy, that maybe you could say. So I, I, I think you're giving good advice. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I'll be quoting an audiologist in my, okay. I mean, <laughs> as, as, as Russ said, you know, one's perception of hearing loss is a pretty fragile criteria. <laughs> right. And uh, to talk about over-the-counter hearing aids just a little bit further, you know, there are going to be a lot of people that try over-the-counter hearing aids and realize it really doesn't solve their problem. Um, so I'm personally not worried about losing business to over-the-counter hearing aids. Most of the patients that I see understand that their hearing loss is not appropriate for an over-the-counter hearing aid. Uh, I think because we do things uh, better by measuring, I think that makes us less susceptible to, feel, to, to experience um, uh, a negative effect of over-the-counter hearing aids. And I think people are surprised when they come to the office and I'm not offended, I'm not defensive or anything like that. And like I said, I went on the internet with one of the patients and wrote down some, a couple of the over-the-counter hearing aids I thought they'd wanna try. I said, come back, I'll charge you for my time, but I'll measure them. So, okay, thanks. Three. Just follow up on one thing. What you're describing, I think, you know, to me makes perfect sense in terms of, you know, capacity, you know, one to service the various uh, hearing aid manufacturers rather than one or two, um, which in my opinion, you know, le leads to conflict of interest, you know, um, but, you know, and where, whereas if you can service all, in all of them, you know, you get a more objective feeling. And secondly, um, you know, the, the, the whole, the, 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 the notion that the um, introduction of over-the-counter hearing aids is going, to, is going to, I would think, you know, create um, cer cer certain opportunities, you know, to provide services you know, which are going to be fairly important to people, whether they realize it at the outset or not, um, both in terms of, you know, me measurement, you know, finding out about um, uh, medical problems, you know, which you're never going to be able to find out without the examination, fi finding out, you know, the type of hearing loss, be you know, you have, I mean, with over-the-counter hearing loss, I mean, you're not obliged to get an examination of any sort, but without the examination, you frankly can't tell the difference between, say, you know, conductive hearing loss and sensorineural hearing loss. Um, so there are all kinds of opportunities, you know, it would seem to me. But what I'm wondering, and, and I'm certainly getting the idea that you're embracing this, but I'm wondering whether other audiologists are, or do you have a sense, you know, whether people are being defensive about the introduction of OTC hearing, hearing aids on the one hand, or are welcoming it as an opportunity on the other hand, or is there some of both? Yeah, I think, yeah, um, I think that's a really excellent question. You know, um, I run my practice uh, with this in mind. I'm here to help people with hearing loss. I think having that attitude puts you in the right place. I'm not out to sell hearing aids. Um, I see a number of my patients uh, that are logged in. I think that they would agree. I hope that they don't feel like I'm trying to sell them something, but that I'm trying to help them. So when somebody comes in with an over-the-counter hearing aid, 
I'm establishing a relationship with that person because if they have a mild hearing loss now, it might progress and and an over-the-counter hearing aid at some point may not be appropriate for them. And, And if I treat them with respect and try to help them, when the time comes, they're probably going to come back to me because I wasn't defensive. Now, relative to other audiologists and their attitude uh, about over-the-counter hearing aids, when, when the legislation was first up, I got a lot of calls from different people because I was in Washington, D.C. We want you to go talk to this senator and that senator and tell them they can't do this and that type of thing. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try to have a different attitude about that. So in that sense, I heard from a number of people that I think felt it as um, something that was a negative and were somewhat defensive over it. So I, as you said at the very end, Russ, I think you're going to find it on both sides. Uh, and I hope what I am hoping is that audiologists will uh, try to figure out ways such as measuring that allows them to address the questions of individuals that come to their office with maybe like I have with uh, over-the-counter hearing aids with them. Thank you. Um, Let's see, Richard Roberts, you had another question, I believe. Richard, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I had been muted, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, For the doctor. You, I am not familiar with real ear measurements. You mentioned targets. What are targets and how do you determine them? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, uh, we have on our website, Potom- potomacaudiology.com, uh, a video on real ear measurements. So if you want, we, I, I was hoping that I could show that today, but it shows us doing real ear measurements. So how we, what we do is that we have a piece of equipment that allows us to key in the results of the hearing test. We use a prescriptive formula that was uh, developed by, uh, uh, let's see, NL1 with National Acoustics Laboratory in Australia, one of the top acoustic laboratories in, in the world. And they determine what should come out of the hearing aid to correct the hearing loss. So on our computer screen, we get a curve that shows what should come out of that hearing aid to correct the hearing loss. At the time of the fitting, we uh, connect the hearing aids that are to be programmed to the software. Most hearing aids have bands. Some is like keys on a piano. Some have three bands, some have 20 bands that I can make louder and softer to frequency shape it. I hang a microphone on the ear that has a little tube that I can put down into the ear canal put the hearing aid in that I'm programming and turn a speaker on that will deliver some sound. Then up on the screen where I have a little dotted line that shows what's coming out, we get a solid line so that we see what's coming out of the hearing aid. So why do I need to do that? Everybody's ear canal is different. Every every ear canal resonates differently. So what causes that to occur? Well, we have a cavity. And that cavity has a size or a volume, it has a shape and it has physical properties. So basically, if you don't measure what a hearing aid is delivering to the ear, you don't know what it's delivering to the ear. So um, most manufacturers have something called a first fit. Typically, uh, in my experience, those first fits will correct the hearing loss maybe 30, 40% with the greatest amount of amplification uh, around two to 3,000 hertz. There's usually not nearly enough big bass frequencies. So the patient will feel like there's that it's tinny. But, but once you measure it and you measure a, a match a prescriptive target, then the patient can listen to it and say it's too loud, too soft. But what we wanna do is have each pitch or frequency at the right volume. We Because different letters in the alphabet. So uh, speech starts at the back of the throat and moves to the front of the mouth. So at the back of our throat are our bass frequencies and our vowel sounds, A-E-I-O-U. I just exaggerated that. 
In the mid frequencies, we typically hear the sounds at the back of the tongue, kind of M and G. And then at the very front of the mouth are our high frequencies, S, H, T, H, etc. So when somebody says a word, we want each of those letters to be the same loudness, because if they're not, the person may have difficulty figuring out the word because all languages, including ours, have many words that sound almost identical, except maybe one letter. And if you don't get that one letter, you may have guessed the wrong word. And I've had times where I don't understand what somebody's saying. And so because I do this as a profession, I think about it. And oftentimes it'll just be one word. And that one word was just one letter. And I didn't get it. So I didn't know if it's dog, fog, or whatever. Uh, and so you don't understand very well. So real ear measures make sure that you're getting the same uh, information all across the frequencies for the word. So you get it correctly. I hope I explained that well for you. Just Thank you. Just, just following up on real ear measurement, I say, Heidi, thank you. You've posted, and it's in the chat box, Dr. Cliff's video on real, real, real excuse me, ear measurement. And uh, so you might want to co copy that down. It's in the chat box. Um, other questions? Well, I don't see or hear any. And if that's the case, um, I would like to follow up on um, Karen's thanking Dr. Lynn for today's presentation. I thought this is very, very useful. Um, at least I found it very, very useful and interesting. I hope others did it well. I'll apologize again for the technical difficulties, the glitches we had at the beginning of the program. I'm glad we were able you know, to resolve them and have everybody who wanted a, had a question to, uh, you know, to, to answer it. Judy, do you have any closing remarks? Before you do that, Russ, can I ask Dr. Lynn to repeat the website for her practice? It's just www. and then Potomac Audiology, all one word, all lowercase dot com. And there's videos. We have we made a video of almost everything we do, uh, including real ear measurements. Thank you, Judy. Any? Uh, I I would I would just say, and and the website is very informative. The videos are terrific. Um, so I, I would commend you to take a look at that for further information. Uh, I just want to say thank you very much again, as others have, Dr. Lynn, always appreciate your expertise and your approachability. Uh, you know, I'm 76, I've worn hearing aids for 40 plus years, and it's good to finally kind of understand objectively versus perceptively what can best help me. I think we all have that challenge. But thank you again. Thank you very much uh, to our captionist, Lisa, and to you all for your, your patience, as Russ said, with some technical glitches in the beginning. Um, I wish everyone a very happy holiday season. Hope some of you will be seeing one another at the Kennedy Center event that, uh, that Rachel talked about. Uh, as I mentioned, our holiday party is on hiatus because of COVID, but we will see you early in the new year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, and thank you for, for inviting me. Take care, all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. And we'll end it here. Thank you.